this edition of What the Fuck Happenings here in Mendham. Some kind of bullshit like that. Anyway, um, still a little hiss in the microphone. <laughs> it's probably something. Um, but anyway, it's a little endeavor to persevere and such. Uh, so maybe I'll read some comments or maybe I'll never get around to it. Um, so anyway, so yes, lots of videos this week, all this Peterson stuff. Um, it's in, almost impossible to paraphrase it because it's so um, scapegoaty and pigeonhole-y, <laughs> you know, just all this misdirection about what the fundamental arguments are as if, you know, these are arguments about psychological positions rather than philosophical positions and thoughtful philosophical positions. You know, people have philosophical positions because they thought about it and that's what they think. You know, their their ideas are connected to other ideas. And, um, you know, almost this argument that somehow you can have too much empathy in some sort of rational way, besides in, in when you turn into some bigotry, like, okay, you have a bunch of empathy for one particular kind of animal, like dogs or cats or something. And you're kind of hypocritical in the sense that the other things that fit in the same categories but aren't as cute or something else, you no longer have this capacity to feel anything. And because you don't feel anything, you don't think anything. And an argument could be made is that thoughtful people are trying to do something different. They're not trying to say, how do I feel about something? They're trying to say, what do I think about something? So they're trying to do the, you know, thoughtful part down rather than the stupid part up. And this sort of gets into other conversations by, you know, <laughs> the more fringe characters, uh, Antikantavad and the modern mystic. So Antikantavad's on his um, taboo, you know, everything that is a, a statement about something being wrong is somehow a fake statement. Like there's no real wrong. It's all just taboos. Uh, they're all just white elephants or sacred cows and there's nothing believed to be wrong for any good reason which is I think anybody rational knows that <laughs> no you can really tell the difference between giving somebody a cupcake and giving somebody a grenade you know for their birthday um, uh, you know a non uh, whatever uh, a ready to explode grenade um, a grenade pie let me just make it some other metaphor um, cupcake versus grenade pie. You can tell that these are different activities and they will have different effects and there's one of them is decidedly malicious and <laughs> intends to do harm and has every uh, indication that it will do harm and the other one is like oh now you'll just give them a little dopamine it might clog some of their arteries but no serious damage done. Um, so that's just a stupid argument but anyway it it bleeds into everything else because it's, it's understanding this difference between feeling and thinking. So the modern mystic is in a, you know, <laughs> is such a strange character. I mean, he's gotten very strange over the last couple of years, really quite, quite strange, in, in that his eccentric, um, everybody's eccentric to some level, right? And you know, the mystic always seemed a little eccentric, but he's downright neurotic. In, in, and I understand neurotic. I'm neurotic, so I understand <laughs> being um, um, uh, differently disabled, <laughs> you know, not able, but disabled. And he really has a hard time dealing with human beings. Um, anyway, so this was sort of displayed because, you know, one person is harassing him on a, on a concept of, of how the brain works and he just finds it obnoxious. And instead of dealing with it in some rational way with this one individual, he's letting it spill over to everything else in his life. And essentially, <laughs> it's quite, a, quite amazing to watch, um, especially in the context that the mystic seems quite capable of being glib about all kinds of things. And, you, you know, you could, you could talk about the horrors of World War II or you talk about, uh, you know, what it's like to die of radiation sickness in Nagasaki or something. Or, and he could glibly have this conversation, you know. <laughs> but, but if you talk about an Internet troll or a particular one, you know, he's gone. He's just left the building in terms of his capacity to have any proportion or um, not to let his feelings own him 
kind of thing. Well, anyway, so the conversation about brains is just so interesting. And, um, you know, um, so anyway, so the, so the, the, the Peterson conversations, a lot of it's just psychology, and none of it gets to, in my opinion, the mechanism. What, you know, what we are is machines, and any understanding of what we are as machines. And that sort of is important. So I've kind of pushed the idea that we can clearly reason, okay? We don't need to do brain scans. We don't need to measure how much dopamine's in your brain or any of this other crap to understand the basic concept of what's happening to organisms on planet Earth. And clearly, in my opinion, <laughs> reasoning allows you to figure out pretty much that feelings had to come first. These feelings create a reflexive reaction in the first place. We have these we have reflexes that almost almost respond faster than the feelings. But that clearly sensation, okay, was a reflex. Uh, like the other knee jerks. And you wouldn't call a knee jerk intelligence. Okay, it was it isn't doing some in, uh, complex calculation. It's just nature sets a spring for you because certain things happening, certain temperatures are automatically got to be bad, can't be a good thing. And so there'd be a reaction. You know, certain incursions into your flesh can't be a good thing. <laughs> you know, it can't be good touch. Okay. And so there's a reflexive reaction. And part of those reflexes at some point became sensation. And then sensation could be dealt with uh, as a um, um, as a as a status that indicated there might be something worth paying attention to. Um, that um, you're going to measure now instead of measuring temperature over one tiny millisecond of time, you could measure it over a minute of time or two minutes of time. And that's kind of what sensation set us up for is being able to measure events in longer periods of time. That's one of the more complex arguments that you could make. Um, but the real the point is is that if you think about thinking, there's no point in thinking unless you have something to think about. And what <laughs> what there is to think about is how do I feel? And that's clearly the order that the brain bestowed these faculties on us. And then the, and the secondary argument can be when you just say the word consciousness, what is the outstanding feature? Now, the outstanding feature isn't the calculations my brain is doing to create my sentences. Those we know is just like the computer. Okay, it's just doing a bunch of, a bunch of bit work to manufacture what it has practice doing and it's doing my grammar for me and it's shoving the words and the sentences from pieces of memory and constructing it in a very mechanical way. Um, so mechanical and so reliable that we have personalities in that we make the same, <laughs> we make errors that are very peculiar to us and enhancements that are very peculiar to us as individuals. So clearly the programming is really structured and it isn't doing um, it's doing something very consistent and rigid, and that's why your personality is, generally speaking, very consistent and rigid. Um, your mannerisms, your... And unless you're deliberately trying to be creative, it's not creative, I guess would be the point. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very mechanical thing, thinking, you know, just, just programming. Uh, but the interesting bit is the feeling bit. That's when you say the word consciousness, yes, that's the important bit, the, the, the bit that just screams at you, I'm aware because I'm feeling, I'm sensing. And that's what we're doing. We're sensing, we're feeling the world, and we're feeling it in a qualitative way all the time. So even though most of the time our feelings are somewhat neutral in terms of our physical sensations, because nothing, we're, we're not being stabbed by the environment or f frozen by the environment, or we've, we've created protections and bubbles against all the little parasites crawling on us and all the other stuff we're supposed to be sensitive to. 
so most of our sensations are internal ones um, that are of an emotional nature. Um, the ones that involve fear and want and desire and those kinds of um, feelings. But those feelings, again, are just made out of ones that are either pleasant, uh, rewarding, um, interesting, or the ones that are obnoxious, unpleasant, uh, irritating, uh, stressful, eh, you know, uh, obnoxious. You could find lots of vocabulary to be used to describe that. And so that's the rudimentary function of consciousness, is feelings. And the only thing that thoughts are doing is creating uh, feedback, um, playing with our feelings. And so every word in our vocabulary, we have a feeling sort of attached to it. So if I say the word fairness, now, Mollyhue uh, <laughs> and Peterson might say, oh, that's just liberal jargon, you know, that, <laughs> that's their trap word, you know, that's their, um, you know, they'll see it as a word, that, oh, that, that's just uh, the propaganda word, you know, there's no real concept here, um, where to me, uh, you, you know, that it's, it's almost the sacred word, that's to me the word you have, that's like Jehovah, you know, fairness, deserve, these are like Jehovah words for me, and to them, these are just weapons the, the lefties use, <laughs> you know, to try to destroy their, their perfect um, control world of, um, you know, might makes right. Um, we inherited it. Uh, <laughs> you know, we earned it through inheritance. Um, so even words like inheritance, right? To some people, this is a, some sort of beautiful, loving family concept where you... You know, you you, <laughs> you somehow are being supportive to your family. Man, and to me, it's just obvious a cheat word, right? It's just, what, we're going to let horses go halfway down the track and then ring the bell and say, fair, fair fight? Yeah, that's silly. It's crazy. It's, it's, you know, it violates not only one of my sacred words, the fairness thing and the deserve thing, but yeah, it's just so overtly, like, what, what the hell? What are you talking about? You're doing it for love. You're cheating for your kids for love. And therefore, love is supposed to be a good word. So then again, a word like love. Most people say love. I mean, that's just, oh, yeah, that's the most beautiful word in the universe. They, they have that right in the singularity going, love, 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 love. Like we're all supposed to go to the love. It's a beautiful, wonderful word. And in my brain, my, the sensations are all kind of negative and it's a bunch of static and noise. And I say, what is that? This is the bigot word. This is the word the bigots use, <laughs> you know, to veil their prejudice and their will to do, to talk, their will to destroy fairness and deserve. That's all they want. They just using this love word to destroy deserve, you know, to cheat the game. Um, <clears throat> you know, and the other side of love is all this, um, um, prejudicial um, affection, you know, because like Mr. Spock's been hanging out at my house and we've been drinking together and da, da, da. oh yeah, he's my bud. And so now I will be prejudicial towards Mr. Spock when he didn't really earn it. I mean, sitting around smoking <laughs> and drinking, that doesn't really earn you anything, right? But it does in our psychology and, uh, you know, unless we're smart enough to recognize it. Because we have understood these words for what they're, they're, we have placed the right meaning on these words, the right associations, positive and negative. So, anyway, so that's what our brain is doing, is it's still feeling about what we're thinking. You know, the, the thoughts are built out of words that we feel about, because we have... The, the programming, and the programming is doing the, the, the uh, uh, associating. So I might, when I was five years old, think nature, nature is beautiful, mother nature, blah, blah, blah. animals so cute, blah, 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 blah. and then I learn, ooh, nature not so good. And all of a sudden, you know, mother nature goes from nice, cute, blonde chick 
you know, to Medusa, snakes in her hair, evil, you know, just kind of melted witch face bitch. Um, and I under my brain understands that of the two characterizations of nature, yes, the evil bitch one is correct. That's that one's where all the evidence is. And there's absolutely no evidence that when she's when she's pretending to be cute and fuzzy, she isn't just being a witch, you know, and just trying to seduce people into not seeing the blood and the waste. So, um, so anyway, so this is all kind of, I think, stuff people have to understand, that they're, the mechanisms of these feelings, they're the, the part of you that has the frog part of you, you know, the dumb part of you, is the innate feeling part. And the only thing that can save it, rescue it, is the context of your thoughts, which instead of seeing the, you know, cute little blonde chick as nature, they, your thoughts superimpose the accurate description, and now you react to that. You react to the snakes. You're back to doing the knee-jerk thing, but you're doing the knee-jerk thing to an appropriate stimulus, the true stimulus, not the fake one, okay, that you had been programmed with. And obviously, in most of civilization, the people who have kids pro program their kids with some sort of bullshit, okay, because they're bullshitters. That's why they had kids, is because they're assholes, and they're going to train their kids in being an asshole. Uh, you know, having these delusions of it's a good game, <laughs> you know, go out there and get your cancer like everybody else. You know, I mean, it's, it's just so, it's so stupid on so many levels that if you really told a kid the truth, you know, raised a kid and just, you know, as soon as they start asking questions, just start honestly answering them. Well, you know, I had you because I wanted to, you know, my ego, I kind of just wanted to do some experiments for the fun of it and see what they'd come out like. And, and uh, you know, and yes, yeah, uh, you're just going to live, go through these little traumas of trying to get through this thing without losing your hair and, you know, having your, have, you know, you know, having your wife leave you and all this other bullshit, um, you know, get it, make a decent living, all this kind of shit, and try to do it without getting cancer before you're, you know, 60 years old, and, um, you know, maybe squeak out a few years of comfortable retirement if you're lucky, and that's what you're playing for. Yeah, it's not great, I understand, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Obviously, nobody does that because, first off, they don't want to accept that truth, and they don't have any, see, they don't have any much respect for this truth word. Truth is not one of their sacred words. You know, the, instead, the sacred word is obedience and, uh, you know, um, faith and uh, um, just pretend you're going to be lucky, and then you won't have to worry. Just believe in the luck. Yeah, the magical luck. So that's another word where at one point in my life I would have thought, oh, luck is just such a harmless thing. But no, it's really anti-fair and anti-deserve, and this isn't a good thing at all. Relying on luck, that's a, that's a stupid thing to do. Um, that's not smart at all to sit there and delude yourself with some, I'm going to be lucky and I'm not going to have that happen to me. You know. Oh, the gas truck will never plow off the road and land in my living room or, you know, whatever the thing is. You see something horrible happen to somebody else and you just imagine, well, ah, uh, there's no earthquakes here. <laughs> you know, some kind of bullshit to, to imagine that, no, it's not going to happen to you. When it could happen to you. And you're just pretending it's okay. Because you've eliminated it as a possibility because you're assuming you're lucky. I, I earned it somehow. I've I did the appropriate, you know, luck mantra. And so the worst won't happen to me. So somehow the game is so much better when you figure you're immune to the really bad things you see happening to the other people. And that makes it a lot easier to justify. And so those are thought processes, and those thought processes are, in my opinion, just fundamentally broken. So when you've broken the context of intelligence, and come up with these fake solutions to problems, these delusions that, oh, well, mankind is, 
is going to become transhuman and <laughs> we're going to, you know, whatever, sail the galaxy. Uh, and, you know, all, you know, this mumbo jumbo of some brilliant future, you know, where you're going to, you know, send a bunch of dysfunctional neurotics out into space. <laughs> and somehow the human race out there is going to do something brilliant. When there's every evidence, it's just going to do what it's doing here, which is having a really hard time um, being efficient, um, maximizing potential, um, and, you know, it's basically squeezing the masses to, you know, feed a, a purified blood to 0.01% of the human race. And it's just overtly retarded. And, uh, yeah, but that's more thought processes that are broken because people think that, well, you know, I want to be able to give my son my gold watch. And so what's wrong with people inheriting privilege? <laughs> so they're comparing inheriting your father's gold watch, which I did, um, to um, inheriting the ownership and navigation of, you know, captaincy of the Titanic or something. That somehow you're, you own the boat and you get to be the captain and, you know, and you didn't earn any of it. And they can't make a separation between those two things. Somehow their brains aren't clever enough to figure out that the one word, yes, means both things. Okay, inherit a piece of paper that says I love you <laughs> and inheriting a trillion dollars. Those two things are somehow the same thing. And clearly not anywhere close to the same thing and so they just they can't even they can't you know so so their understanding of the word it, their sacred inheritance word is so generalized that they can't allow anything to tarnish it they, they won't accept it they're just going to keep polishing it and so they're just going to keep polishing the truth to eliminate anything that might be an affront to um, their perversely unrepresentative understanding of the concept. That, yes, there's nothing wrong with being nice to your friends. There's nothing wrong with me having a little bit of a prejudice for Mr. Spock. The little things like that we can accept because we're human. We're animals. We're not perfect. All right. But gigantic abuses, insane excesses, can't be justified, can't be defended. These are overtly insane. They're as insane as let's have a racetrack and then let's have races and the race will be <laughs> if the horse's father won a race, then we let him go start halfway up the track. And everybody will show up to watch this race. No, everybody will laugh and say, <laughs> what, are you kidding me? I'm going to bet on this. There's no bet to, to be made. You know, unless you break that horse's legs, um, why, why would I bet? It'd be stupid. We know who's going to win. So, um, all right. So the point is, is that you have to really understand, if you're going to talk about a psychology state in the context of a political state, is to understand the difference between the fact that some people are just psychologies. The sheeple, for example. You know, they're just running on the sacred words and jargon, and they, they're they not doing any intelligent feedback. I mean, their brain is not providing them a context, because, you know, as I pointed out, in examples like, you know, perceiving Mother Nature as a a, a, a beautiful, loving woman versus perceiving it as a nasty, horrible, monstrous, you know, blood-sucking vampire Borg thing. Um, <clears throat> their perceptions are so broken. So they have these fake gods and these, these fake concepts of salvation and what's going to, you know, well, God will come to the rescue so we don't have to worry about it. Some kind of, you know, they have these back doors for which they slip away from the truth. They just escape having to face the truth, face the consequences, the real implications of what they're saying or what they're doing, 
and it's just such a pile of crap. Um, so I want to make this more pointed, but you know, it's sort of like what Jordan Peterson brought up the Holocaust, and, and, and Stefan Molly, who often always does this, right? And this is an Anaconovod thing all over the place. You know, this demonizing the commies, and the commies just wanted to kill people, and that's what they're about killing. Kill, 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 kill. And they had, you know, they didn't have any, they didn't have any, um, spiritual words. They didn't have any concepts they were fighting for. No, they were just these evil um, killers. And, and this, you know, this is an insane context. No, no it's, it's completely unintelligent to think of the Holocaust as Jews turned into lampshades. Or anybody turned into a lampshade. As if the as if the Nazis wanted to just turn things into lampshades, like they wanted to sell lamps. <laughs> you know, that wasn't what it was. What it was was an insane, out of, out of proportion bigotry. They scapegoated, okay, uh, other races. That simple. Um, and I don't know what the word for what they did in terms of the whole black thing, besides what I would argue is their aesthetics. I mean, Germans were, you had a very narrow aesthetic culture, and I just don't think they could accept the existence of black people on, on planet Earth. And so they didn't, because they didn't have to. It wasn't, there wasn't any in their world. It wasn't something they had to accept, so they didn't accept it. And they certainly didn't want to. And it was just against their whole their Aryan prejudice, okay, and um, and then the Jews, we know there was a whole context there, okay, I mean, Germany had been basically screwed by bankers, and a lot of the bankers were Jewish, you know, a lot of the money with, you could blame it like on the Rothschilds and stuff like that, and there was this, you know, there, there was a, some Jews did some what you could argue as um, um, committed crimes, <laughs> okay, uh, crimes against uh, uh, people for greed, essentially. And so it was a real crime. It wasn't a non-existent crime. The German people suffered insanely, okay? Even if you thought Germany was wrong in World War I, it's insane to sit there and say, it's just, it's just like what we did to to Iraq and what we did to the armies under Saddam Hussein. You know, the fact that we killed them when they were retreating. So instead of killing Saddam Hussein, you know, we killed his soldiers. Instead of killing Hitler, uh, you know, we killed his people, kind of argument. And the Nazis were grotesquely guilty of this imbecility of saying it wasn't the philosophy of some Jews it was somehow in the nature of the Jew, okay, that they were demons. So it was almost a religion, and it had no connection to rationality. So in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to create empathy, and if you want to, I know, fear monger is kind of the wrong word, if, if you want people to understand that there's something to be afraid of, in the nature of human beings, and you want to use Nazis as an example. In my opinion, the the example is placing the Star of David on them in the first place. Okay, the the segregation. Okay, saying you're not a real citizen, and you know you can't live among us. Those were overt statements of what was to come. I mean, that was just spelling it out. And so some people say it's like a, some sort of surprise, you know, World War II. There was no surprise, okay? I mean, you can't, I mean, it's, if somebody starts pinning a label on you, you've got to see that as just a target. And sooner or later, they're going to put a bullet through the target. Um, you know, so there's no, you know, it's no different than tattooing with, you know, ownership papers. I mean, that you know, the tattooing came much later, but I just mean, it's like marking your slaves. It's like branding your animals. You got to know that once they've done that to you, you know, you're their property. And um, you're no longer 
something to be you're something that is useful until it's not and as soon as it's not useful you, nothing's nothing good's going to happen to it so i'm not making any defense of nazis but i'm just saying you have to understand the progression so the pro progression was first an insane uh, perception that it was all jews or somehow responsible <laughs> stupid um, then uh, this idea that well we're going to punish them with this censure okay which is essentially if it was to happen to germany if they were to be sanctioned in some way then they would feel cheated just like they did after world war one so they're doing they're committing the same crime again so it's almost like you know Israel and its control of Palestine, how that's fundamentally never going to work, <laughs> you know, can't work. Um, so so I, it's just funny how the, the the victims end up becoming the perpetrators. Um, but anyway, um, I, I don't want to get into the whole Holocaust thing. I mean, I really don't want to. <laughs> I'm just trying to say, to to define the Holocaust based on the idea of a lampshade is, in my opinion, just an insane, it, it doesn't represent anything close to the rudimentary or fundamental crime, which is the scapegoating and the bigotry. Because you know, once you've justified that, of course you've justified the disposability. So when Germany's losing the war, <laughs> yes, the final solution is, what, the, what, what did somebody think the final solution would be? Free the Jews? <laughs> you know, no. Uh, you know, yes, suck whatever blood's left in them, you know, and, and the argument is, is, well, now that we've almost s sort of created super Jews, you know, because any Jew who's still alive is a really strong Jew, so that's the last thing we want walk on the earth is stronger Jews. So, yeah, find a way to have it out of an accident. And the, and the final solution really was that um, cynical. But the cynicism already happened when they were put the Star of David on them. The game was already over back then. So let's just understand that once you describe yourself, and once you've defined your enemies, then it's a war. So all these people bring up the gulags and for Stalin and all this stuff, they're bringing it up in a context that's completely artificial, as if nobody had offended anybody, that there were no victims um, defending themselves, that there were, was no reasoning behind the fact that it's either us or them. And that's truly what it is. So, I mean, you could just point out the Civil War, you know, terrible, horrible. Um, it would have been really nice if they could have spent a little more time trying to find a compromise. <laughs> but they didn't. And, and they didn't probably for some cynical reason. I can imagine that the North was kind of calculating, well, if we give them another two years, you know, before we say enough is enough, um, what's going to be the consequence if we try to prevent war? Well, then we've given them two years to prepare for war. And that's going to be really to our disadvantage because they have a lot of money. <laughs> okay, and they can, they can start um, gearing up a military complex that um, we won't be able to overwhelm. So, you know, it was sort of the game was, you know, the, the rational calculation was if it's inevitably going to come to war, we better do it now while we're stronger uh, than when we're weaker. Um, that kind of thing. But to say that all this stuff, you know, to, to point these, they point these fingers and say, this was, that's what they wanted. Stalin wanted to kill people. And it's just such a perversion of the truth. It's just obnoxiously stupid. He fought, okay, a war, an ideological war. And, you know, this idea that you can fight your ideological war and, um, you know, especially in the past context where assassinations and all kinds of other shit happened all the time, uh, all kinds of cheaters and such going on, uh, you know, it ends up turning gorilla, and you know. So anyway, I'm just saying it. It just, in my opinion, it reveals to, to when somebody does something like that. When somebody says the Holocaust is about lampshades, to me, that's just screams that they've never really thought about 
the whole engine of World War II and all of the atrocities and all of the backstabbing and all of the bullshit that went on. And they just have a, they just want to make it as simple, you know, and it's not that simple. It's just bullshit. And they're doing it just to demonize a cause. And in this case, <coughs> you know, it just depends on who they're trying to label with the fascism or label with the communism. And uh, it's just really, it's for the small brains and not for people who are supposed to be intelligent, knowledgeable, who are supposed to have all of these little context uh, programs, you know, where they react to words and recognize, ah, it's a bigger word than that. There's more to it. Oh, I don't know. It's a really tricky to get into this subject because these are all trigger words for people. They're so used to um, playing with them, you know, gulagging people, <laughs> you know, this scape gulagging or whatever you want to call it, um, that, you know, there's just such a reactionary reaction. And um, obviously some people have, for, for good reason, um, very personal connections to events in history because they live there or they live through it or they're ancestors lived through it and they were on the crappy end of some stick and um, you know they're they're very um, conscientious of somebody not um, cheating the, the the pain imposed on their people so to speak so I'm sorry if I'm offending somebody I'm just trying to ex explain that it's it's not as simple as this stupid propaganda where there are people who are fundamentally just evil against us good guys. That's not the battle. The battle is over stupid ideas versus good ideas. Now, the North had a good idea, okay, that this is wasteful. Enslaving people is a waste of suffering. It's an indignity to the human race, uh, and we got to get rid of this. And the South had a bad idea, which was, we don't want the inconvenience of growing up. <laughs> you know, we just don't. It, we have a whole system set up here, and we kind of like it. We don't want to really have to do this, you know, figuring out how to, how to integrate um, these slaves into our community. And they probably thumbed their nose a bit at the at the north, you know, saying, "Well, we have a lot more uh, slaves, and so you're asking us to put a lot more of these people into our society." Uh, you know, that kind of argument was probably in there somewhere. Um, you know, we have to make a lot more mules and 50 acres, some kind of crap like that. Um, <clears throat> well, anyway, <laughs> just just making the point that. There are battles between ideas that you can understand the ideas, okay, were fundamentally lopsided in the sense that the South really didn't have any good ideas on its side, and the North did have all the progressive, for the future, um, for your dignity, yes, this is the way to go. And so when people bring up, um, you know, <laughs> You could bring up the Japanese part of the World War. You could bring up the Nazi part of the World War. You can bring up Stalin, gulags, communism. Those things, in my opinion, those wars weren't about things as ideologically pure as the difference between slavery and uh, freedom. It wasn't as clear-cut uh, a winner in terms of the ideological position. And um, it's really unfair to pretend that you can um, black-white those arguments. These are not, it's not that black and white. That's all I'm saying. All right, so that, that whole conversation probably got me in more trouble than it, it clarified. <laughs> so, but I just wanted to get to the point that the brain is fundamentally a feeling instrument 
and the feelings are programmed. And so the interesting part, you know, why are we conscious is always a stupid question because I could tell you that your consciousness is just a byproduct of the mixing of past sensations, you know, um, my, my body, let's say my body records everything that happens to me in this millisecond. Now, it's not recording it consciously. It's just recording no pressure on the fingers, a little clammy on my palm here maybe. You know, I got a hair twitch in my ass. I got th -th 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 -th, some little bullshit. And it records that. And what it's really doing is associating that with something, that condition, which is right at this moment it's a non-condition but let's just say I was in a sauna and I was really hot it would be associating it with words hot moist blah 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 these things and what it's doing is it's now it can take a, a two hours later my I can have my current feeling state and my brain can take that recording and superimpose it in a sense on my current feeling state my current sensations and it does it in this subconscious way, so you don't get to see the, the mixing of the two. But they're mixed. And as I'm trying to point out, words are essentially pieces of sensation. They're pieces of environment. They're sunny places and rainy places. <laughs> you know, they're stormy and calm. They're, um, you know, wet and dry. They're they're full of this texture of meaning to the sensate organism and it's those it's that superposition of the meaning the hologram of the past flies into you because and sticks <laughs> to your current condition now i'm using a lot of metaphors obviously there's no what i just said doesn't happen physically that way i'm just getting to the point that the only real little spark there is, consciousness isn't a big thing, I guess is what I'm trying to argue. There's nothing profoundly weird about it, in a sense, beyond the little tiny part where you say our brain synthesized good and bad. It created it as a reality for the first time. See, good and bad doesn't really exist in the environment. And but the genetic organism, you know, the one replicating and trying to win and succeed, needs a concept of good and bad. Good to go around the tree, bad to try to walk through the tree, that kind of thing. So our brain has a real advantage, okay, in being able to synthesize good and bad and place it in front of us. And that's what a feeling does. It synthesizes good and bad. It makes it real. If we didn't feel, it wouldn't matter whether we just crash into the tree. Feeling makes something that only matters to a genetic organism real. So in a sense, it, by trying to synthesize the concept of value, which really didn't exist, your survival didn't mean anything before you were sensate, it couldn't possibly mean anything because you couldn't feel bad about dying, you couldn't feel good about it, nothing could feel good or bad about it, so it couldn't really be consequential. There was no difference between the cupcake and the grenade pie. They were both the same thing before feelings. Uh, but the idea for your genetic code, there was a concept of good or bad. My code winning was important to the DNA, so to speak. And Therefore, feeling became a very valuable thing because it made, it made value for the DNA molecule into something your brain could play with. And the irony, as I state, is value didn't really exist until the mammal organism or the, the brain-enabled organism synthesized it. And it did that a long time ago. Hundreds of millions of years ago, the first ouch happened. Something around a trilobite, okay? The first ouch occurred, and the organism now had a value, an engine it could build that could create reward and punishment. Reward and punishment now existed, and now it could use these synthetic 
perceptions of reality, you know, these memories, and it could augment them and create programming where you would learn through positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement to do a certain thing. So now you could bump into the tree, go, ow, that sucked. Okay, so now you didn't have to understand why you're not allowed to go through trees. All you had to understand was tree hurdy, you know, not good. That's all. And now you could understand really easy, trees aren't good for your comfort. And that's all you need to know. Nothing, <laughs> it's, not, it's not to your advantage to try to go through trees at all. It's to your disadvantage. And it, it taught you this simple lesson. So now, now you didn't need any complex understanding of why, why you have to go around the tree. You didn't have to know about matter <laughs> and why you're not allowed to go through it and all that kind of crap. Why the atmosphere is thinner than the tree and there's more matter and there's more atomic weight and your electrons can't go through it and blah, 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 blah. You didn't need to know any of the physics. You just need to know that doesn't work. And you were told it wasn't work because of a, a crude sensation that got the job done. All right. <clears throat> so once we had this little kernel of feeling, this ouch, then you can make everything else comes out of it. So you create an ouch, a negative sensation. And then when you remove the negative sensation, you have a net positive. Because if something keeps going ow, 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 ow. It's really irritating. It just keeps irritating you. It keeps going negative, negative, negative. And if you take it away, it's the same thing as creating a real positive. So we could be positively reinforced in our behavior by merely taking away the negative. So I could put, I could put a shackle on you as a slave or something that's irritating your skin and tearing it. It's really uncomfortable. And as a reward, I could take the shackle off. <laughs> I haven't done you any real good. I've just taken away a bad, but you might be really, really grateful, <laughs> you know, and you might have a lot of positive feelings, a little warm and fuzzy feelings for the guy who took that thing off, because you're going to feel better. So now the reward and punishment is really just one thing. There's no carrot. There's just the whip and the absence of the whip, uh, and, uh, you know, it ends up being that simple. So consciousness is just the fact that the brain is synthesizing this qualitative feeling of an obnoxious bit of electricity versus a non-obnoxious bit of electricity. And that's all that really is the distinction. That's all the magic of it. It's just its capacity to create some, some piece of information that in some way has this extra feature that makes us capable of feeling it instead of it just being a picture of something. It's not just a picture. It's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a feeling. It's, what is that? Ow. Ow. You know, what, ow. You know, what is that? So anyway, so that still needs to be explained. But I mean, the fact that we are conscious doesn't need to be explained. There's no bizarreness to the fact of it. Because it's just the fact that you can't mix, okay, the old and the new. You can't mix sensation, current sensation, with anything without us being conscious. I mean, as soon as you're feeling, you're conscious. You can't escape being conscious having feelings where you could be unconscious and have thoughts. So really, it's all about the feelings first and the... The real message is the feelings are the lowest evolved part of us. And, um, you know, people have to understand that, that our drives, desire, motivations are programmed. Much of our programmed sensibilities have not been programmed by our knowledge. They've been programmed by who hit us with a stick when we were five years old and what color hat were they wearing. And, you know, those kind of contexts are the things that have really um, created how we feel about the world as we interact in it. And our thoughts can only do so much to augment that. So and then you get into the subject of um, um, the psychotic and um, the, what I would call the difference between people. 
you know, the, the selfish versus the less selfish. So we're all selfish assholes, and some of us are less selfish assholes. And that's really the only difference there is here. That's the only battle that's being fought. And the argument could be made is that the, you can understand that some of us are innately um, dangerous because of what we desire. So you could argue that a pedophile is innately dangerous because he desires something that's very hard to have, okay, without risking the welfare of the victim. And like a Jeffrey Dahmer, somebody who needs to completely control somebody and, um, you know, essentially eat them, you know, control them so much, you know, and, <laughs> you know, the ultimate control is, <clears throat> it's like I've often said, you know, that, that, that if I was to be a warrior, you know, I would, I would probably have some sort of quirk. Like if I was one of those historical characters, you know, they would write about him that, yes, he took his victim and, and, um, you know, the defeated enemy, <laughs> you know, like if I defeated some king, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and yes, I'd like eat his eyeball, you know, just as a, just to complete the task of, I've owned you, you know, because I'm going to eat your fucking eyeball, fucker. Um, so those are like um, just bizarre um, mechanisms uh, of, of programming, of, you know, our subjective um, taste. And, um, you know, and they can be often like, fairly labeled psychotic and just so distant from anything reasonable. Like you know, having sex with dogs or something. <laughs> and, but the danger isn't so much being psychotic. That is having some. Oh yes, I, I think that might be enjoyable. Uh, <laughs> you know, to, to eat a couple of assholes. I mean, asshole humans. <laughs> um, um, either either kind would be a little bit weird. Um, but anyway, um, but the thought isn't so bad. The idea that you might desire it isn't so bad. The bad is not having the intelligence to know you can't, you can't act it out. You can't have what you want. You can't have what you desire. You can't be selfish. It's too expensive. And, you know, that to me is the real argument. Is that, yes, there's a fundamental problem and some people want things that are just not really um, practically you're not going to have what you want. You're not going to get what you want. There's, it doesn't exist. It's like almost some men want perfect women and, you know, really, really rare and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying some women don't want Prince Charming and that's just, you know, forget it. It's not going to happen. Um, and um, so wrong expectations, you know, uh, uh, unrealistic expectations are excessive. Um, um, I don't know what the right word for it is. Uh, I mean, there's a word for when you have a, a, a sexual, um, uh, you know, one of those trivial things, uh, fetish. <laughs> yeah. So you could almost consider these as sort of fetishes. Humans have fetishes. And there's some people have really boring and simple fetishes, and other people have really elaborate and complex fetishes. Like they need 100,000 actors to play out the role and they need it to be really complicated, where another guy just needs, you know, a fake fur blanket or something, and it's, oh, cool, got it. <laughs> that does it for me. Um, and then the second problem is, is the having the capacity to understand what you're allowed to take, uh, because it's reasonably priced, and what you're not allowed to take because it's not reasonably priced. Uh, it costs too much. It's too risky. Um, and it's too impositional, okay? You don't pay the price, somebody else pays the price. Those kind of arguments. So, yeah, so the real argument, in my opinion, is often just going to be about what constitutes a fair fight, um, you know, what, um, you know, All right, I'll just leave it where I've left it because <laughs> there's no point in getting into the, the details of specific arguments made and how 
how unfair they are to any kind of rational foundation of what, you, what the hell you're talking about. And so I guess I would argue that, it, you know, in my opinion, you're not really intelligent if you don't really understand that the only thing we're playing for on this planet, the only thing of value that's happening here, none of our ambitions have any value. None of our our personal narratives of being a Jedi or being a gold medal winner or being loved by women or being this or being that. None of that crap has any value whatsoever. The only thing that has value in the end is whether you went from A to B and how you felt getting there, what you experienced as a consciousness, and what you made other conscious things feel. And the only equation is Okay, did you cause more harm than the amount of harm, in a sense, you prevented? And that's it. That's the only equation in town. And the real problem with that equation is it just doesn't provide you with any capacity to do anything good except preventing bad. And so then you get back into this whole argument about why people have wars, why people disagree, why they hate each other, is because they think the person they're arguing with, okay, is going to cause more harm. They're going to make more suffering. They're going to waste it, essentially. Here we have a clear path where we can go this way, and it won't cause harm and suffering and torture and anguish and misery. Or we can go your jackass way and make ten times more of it. That kind of thing. And that's what the arguments are about is a difference in perception about how much wasted suffering, and it's wasted if it could be prevented, <laughs> essentially. I would say always wasted. Especially when you think the real value is you preserve something that's completely unnecessary. One could argue that Van Gogh's paintings are really beautiful, uh, magnificent, wonderful. Fine. But if I eliminated them from human history, do you really think life on Earth would be diminished? That we wouldn't just find something else beautiful to admire? That there wouldn't be an adequate replacement? It's, you know, in my opinion, I think that's where this conversation always goes sideways for most people, is because they always inject some notion of value that is completely a, their projection. It has nothing to do with anything where you could argue there was a real need served. So it's almost like, okay, there was a whole bunch of crap recently about um, Toys R Us and going out of business. And there's lots of things to criticize, like the slimy business practice of buying a company off the market, off the public market, with all debt, and then saddling the company with the debt, and then bailing yourself out by forcing the company to buy your shares, essentially, <laughs> as more debt. So you ruin the company and walk away scot-free. Um, there's lots to complain about that process and that being somehow legal or right or responsible or decent as behavior. But the real question is, you know, people are hysterical, like, oh, all these jobs lost and all ruin, ruin. There's not really happening, right? I mean, Toys R Us didn't sell more toys, okay? It just sold some percentage of the toys that will be sold. And they will be sold someplace else. The buildings it occupied will be bought by somebody and they will sell new stuff from those buildings. So there will be more jobs created then. So I'm not saying it's not wasteful to go through these transitions unnecessarily. I mean, of course it is. The buildings sometimes degrade, they get water damage, they get this and that, they're closed up. Um, there's lots of problems with having these idiotic transitions that are completely unnecessary. Lots of waste involved. But you can't really make the argument that Toys R Us was making jobs. And people do this on both sides, the left and the right. The left thinks, <laughs> you know, just as retardedly as the right, as if something besides demand creates supply. When we know demand does it not something else. The suppliers don't create the demand. Uh, no legitimate demand, we could argue. I mean, they might fool some people into buying shit they don't need, 
but there's clearly nothing really productive in that economy. And the real productive economy doesn't, isn't going to be affected by changing the name from Toys R Us to um, Big Shoes R Us. You know, just doesn't matter in the long run. All right, these are all <laughs> went quite far of the field here. So I was going to read some comments. I'll read a couple and then we'll get out of here. Sorry. I intended to get somewhat philosophical. I just didn't, you know, so many of you are just not up to it. You know, so right over your heads. Anyway, all right, so here's a guy justifying the lampshade. That's a good one. In Mendham, the lampshade example is used because it is highly graphic. Yeah, the point is it's, it's a, a, a cartoonish representation. It's, yes, it's highly graphic, but is it honest? Does it really describe the, 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 the does it describe in any, in any true way all of the crimes of World War II? Does it represent in any way um, getting to the point? And I would argue it doesn't go anywhere near the point. Nazis were not lampshade makers. It's just stupid. That wasn't their ambition. They didn't, they didn't cross Europe so they could make lampshades. It's just stupid. Anyway, and easy to remember as an, as an epitome? No, can't be. Of the inhumanity of World War II. So again, it's not. Dying, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just so stupid to sit there and play this game like the what World War II is is the rape of the 13-year-old French girls. The, the World War II is the, the, the kids with the blown off legs. World War II is the lampshades. World War II is lots of people died in lots of horrible ways. And representing a horrible death by a lampshade or any other kind of thing, anyone who is, who, anyone who's, whose dignity or, um, um, you know, the, their, their human dignity, um, um, the obligation not to torture. Again, it's it's not it's not a good representation because it doesn't get to the frickin' crime. Again, killing your enemies is not a crime. Killing your enemies nastily even isn't a crime, especially if you've been a victim. So if you're if you're if you're if somebody rapes your daughter, and you know you kick the guy's face off, you know. I could, I could epitomize that. I could say, look at that horrible crime. Look at how he brutalized that guy so unnecessarily. That really wouldn't be getting to the, the core of it, right? That wouldn't really be getting to what happened and why it happened. And it wouldn't get to a real understanding of what the first crime was at all. So, fuck that. Anyway. And everything around the time. So again, I'm just saying it's, a, in my opinion, no, it's a cartoon representation. It doesn't even get close. You're throwing around bars of soap and gas chambers and, you know, all of this crap about how when it's about why. Okay, it's not about how people died. It's about why they died. <sighs> Shit. Anyway, this is an error in your thinking constantly. Fuck you. Uh, you take something and interpret it with your resentful, ultra negativity. Says you again. Just complete rubbish talk. Why don't you actually argue with the argument, okay, stupid-looking person? Why don't I just bring up irrelevancies? You're stupid-looking. <laughs> there. Am I done now? Fuckhead. Effectively turn it in on its head and then start arguing from there and make your own logical conclusions. The entire logical statement, just as in this video, I seem to, in my opinion, I, I go to some tedious length to try to be careful in the verbiage and try to start from the lowest point, the simplest idea, getting to the most complex, or vice versa. I try to reduce it to the thing that really matters, the thing that's really at the core of the thing. And in my opinion, that's obviously what I'm doing. So this perverse 
paraphrase. It's just your petty reaction to the fact that you don't have a counter-argument that means anything. It's a total fallacy as you manipulated the premise by twisting it then drawing your own conclusions. What's a fallacy? Where's the fallacy? I'll, guess what? The fallacy is that World War II is best represented by a lampshade. That's a fallacy. And quite logical thought processes from there. It's probably so ingrained from your hardship in life. Well, again, I, it wasn't no hardship in life. I had a pretty typical childhood. I mean, I didn't have, like, scarlet fever and, you know, I didn't have my legs cut off. I didn't have any super hardship. I just walked through a regular childhood and said, gee, all these adults are lying stupid fox. So I guess there's a game here, and I'm being gamed. Because why else are people lying, right? But you don't lie unless you're trying to fool somebody. Gee, that's pretty obvious. I figured that out when I was about five. Uh, with your sister and everything negative. Again, it's not just that. So again, this just lampshade my own arguments here. Tell me what I represent or what, what means something in my past experience or how I developed my philosophy. More crap from a, a fucking shit for brain. So instead of making any real argument, just more crap about how you somehow know I'm wrong and yet you won't detail any wrong sentence. Okay, that's it. Just the basic way you think. Yeah, well, fuck you. You smell. Uh, shit, if you could see it, your view of life could be so much more balanced. And balanced in what way? <laughs> you know, so again, this, this idea that we should... Okay, let's look at a fact. Okay, ten lion cubs killed horribly to have lions. So for every one adult lion, or let's say a, a pair... We kill 10 cubs. Now, my balanced view of that should be, oh, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you should die 10 times before you live once, right? That makes sense to me, right? I would perfectly sure sign up to get cancer and die 10 times so I can live once. So every time I get one life where I survive, not necessarily even in blissful life, but just survive my life, I get to die 10 times. And I'm supposed to have a balance. The balance perspective is to say, good deal. Sorry, no sale. Uh, your absolute resentfulness. So again, there's no evidence that I am at all resentful in the sense that there's no evidence that I don't have, uh, <laughs> if anything, somebody could argue that I am too vain and too confident and too certain and too completely pleased with myself than to even be able to argue that it's any kind of resentment. For what? What am I resenting? And again, I couldn't make it clearer, right? We're going to have a horse race. Okay, you say, my horse starts over here. Your horse starts halfway down the track. I say... I think this is bullshit, and you call that resentful. And that's what you call balanced thinking. That's being rational. It's not rational for me to say, that's neither fair or a day well spent. I'm not going to bother even coming close to playing that. I'm not playing that, asshole. Fuck you, okay? If that's the track, I'm burning it down. It's a piece of shit. If those are the rules you play by, we ain't playing by your rules. Oh, I mean, amazing. Anyway. Uh, your absolute resentfulness is sabotaging yourself. Well, again, I don't... You know, whatever. You're, you're torturing your own kids. I mean, you're eating your young. I mean, you're the one who's the stupid snake eating its ass. Okay, and it's actually dangerous. No, you're actually dangerous. And so, again, so, so you're just illustrating. This guy thinks good words are inheritance. Okay, and you're just a resentful, petty loser if you say something like, that's cheating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, hilarious logic. 
All right, based on wrong conclusions, you are making mistakes. Yeah, well, fuck you. Fuck you. Jesus. Not an argument anywhere in there. All right, Jordan Peterson, looks and sounds. I can see, I, I really not too interested, people. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you're going to worry about how somebody sa sounds or how they look, you can make a little comment. Look, I made a little comment. He looks a little dead. Yeah, he looks a little bit like a zombie, sure. All right, fine, fine, fine. But you don't need to just keep piling that kind of shit on. It's just not a very good argument. And frankly, it makes me feel a little bit humiliated when I do it, just because when I see people write that crap, I'm like, what the fuck? You, you, you bother typing words to do that? You know, not much of an argument. <laughs> not that I disagree with it, but I just mean it's not much of an argument. And we all know, I think, that we're not supposed to judge messengers. We're supposed to judge messages. All right. Let's see. The lampshade canard is now officially accepted as bullshit. Well, I don't know if it's officially accepted by people who need to accept it, but whatever. Um, I think it's clearly... Uh, recognize that the evidence is a little bit uh, vaporous. You know, it doesn't really have any. All right. Um, Peterson's fixation on Petro principle. So that that is this was an interesting part. I mean, I didn't realize I had, you know, YouTube flipped the video on me, right? I mean, I just hit the play button and somehow it, it you know, it, it does this whatever. It has links all over the place somehow. When you click on something, it goes somewhere. Well, anyway, so it, flip me to a new video and then I try to get back to the old video and I got back to the wrong video. So anyway, so yeah, so he's just talking about this this 80-20 rule. It's just so hilarious that, you know, anybody could make up shit like this. 80-20, 85-15, 90-10. I could find these patterns everywhere about everything and then a lot of them are going to be meaningless patterns. I mean, I could have a rule about this, this tape dispenser that 98% of the tape is quite usable. But that last little bit on the roll is all fucked up for some reason. So it's no good. So it's the 98-2 principle. You know. <laughs> it's just stupid. I mean, it's amazing that people are so hungry for... I mean, this is just more of the example of the, the, the Twitter psychology or something. We want everything... Uh, you know, turn it, make it so fucking simple. And it's, you can't make things that simple. It's retarded to sit there and try to force things into into something that simple, uh, you know. And and the funniest part is it started off with some guy who was recognizing that twenty twenty percent of the people owned eighty percent of the country, and um, I don't know why it turned into some rule that oh let's have the same imbecilic uh, ratio everywhere. So yeah, we've done something really stupid. Let's do it everywhere. Oh, I mean, fuck. All right. Uh, leaving guns only in the hands of the proven lunatic government is not a better option, Gary. I don't I, you know. This is really idiotic, right? Leaving guns only in the hands of a proven lunatic government. So he somehow he's proven that the government is a lunatic. Right. And I don't know where he has that proof. You know, that the democracy is so failed that it's not actually representing you assholes. <laughs> I mean, amazing bullshit, right? They elect a lunatic that's completely on their side, and they're still afraid of the government. Still afraid. Um, it's a better option, Gary. A better option to what? I mean, you people are just hilarious. So this, again, gets to sort of Antikhanovod. Like, you know, in terms of somehow we're supposed to not choose sides, and then once we've chosen our side, to be rather, you know, judicious. In getting the job done. So these idiots think they're going to sit there with their guns and have a fight with the United States military, right? The, you know, they're going to sit there with their shotguns or even their AK-47s and, you know, the Apache helicopters are going to shoot missiles from two miles away and blow their house up. I mean, I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind piloting one of them, to tell you the truth. And I'll, yes, I'll hit the button. Yes, just kill the fucker. He's shooting the United States government. Kill him. Yeah, blow his house up. Fuck him. All right, who has time for this nonsense, this fucking idiot? So, yeah, that's what happens in war. And I, I'm just saying, if you think you're going to win a war against the government, you're just too retarded. But anyway, see, that's another one of these dodges. The subject doesn't have anything to do with, I need to fight the government. The subject is clearly, they just feel like bigger men because 
they have power. So they don't have any power, you know, in themselves. You know, they can't use the lightsaber. So they have to get a real gun. <laughs> yeah. They're not real Jedis, I guess is the argument. Um, uh, you know, and they're certainly not doing, you know, these are all usually Christians and all this kind of stuff. They're definitely not showing any faith in their God, which is just so funny, right? These, these Christians who need a gun. Because God's not going to save them. God doesn't know what's best. God's will shouldn't be done. It's just so obvious. Uh, and it's just so, you know, hilariously ironic. Uh, I'm just, look, my argument isn't you shooting home guns. I'm just saying, it, clearly, okay, letting teenage boys own guns is pretty stupid, okay, frankly. It's just fucking stupid. And if you think you want, you need to raise them in the gun culture, you know, oh, if they don't learn young, then they can't, you know, they can't pick it up later. You know, they have to get on that horse young or they can't ride the gun, the, you know, the gun horse or whatever. It's just so stupid. You know, but go, all right, you know, you, you're, you're lunatics, fine. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to take your guns away. I'm just trying to say, you know, logically, it's just really stupid to let people of, of mar with marginal control <laughs> mechanisms to have guns. It's, you know, they're not going to shoot the government. They're going to shoot you, shithead, or your kids. So get what you deserve, Ugh, assholes. Um, uh, let's see. A less stupid Molinex debate. Oh, please. Your audience would benefit from observing which of the two your brain has more in common with. I doubt it. Let's see what the video is. Just so the hell, I hate people who leave links that really don't say anything. As a political fascist, I believe in a regulated market. All right. So somebody he's arguing with somebody who calls himself a political fascist. So that makes some sense. So we're right, right in the beginning, we're already in trouble. But whatever. I'm sure Molly doesn't make any sense because he never does. So it doesn't matter. I don't need to watch it. Uh, spill this, whatever. Uh, crap somewhere else. It's just nothing but spam, in my opinion. Uh, there was plenty of subjects in my videos. Yeah, you don't need extra subjects. I disagree about us handing weapons to psychopaths, so another gun nut. Uh, it, is a result of it is a result of the ne necessity to deter the government from doing whatever they want with us. I mean, it's just so idiotic. I mean... You know, these people, they just, you know, they really are so clueless, you know, that somehow these aren't, that we don't have a real democracy. Now, the fact that you elect people who are perfectly comfortable with huge amounts of corruption, whose fault is that? The fact that you're afraid of laws that might outlaw lying or something or require people to actually take lie detector tests, you know, they're not, they don't, they're not, they're not proof of guilt or innocence, but they're certainly an indication of tendencies. Um, certainly be valued to do. I wouldn't mind. I mean, I'm not afraid of a lie detector test. If I was running for office, I wouldn't be afraid to be able to say, I have no intention of violating anyone's constitutional rights. I'm not afraid to do that. As you know, these psychopaths acquire weapons from other people. That's a lie. So go ahead and lie some more. Okay, that's just nonsense. So fuck you. You're an idiot. They legally acquire guns. <laughs> so it's just stupid. You know, you, <laughs> yeah, and, and you give guns to people in marginal circumstances, and, and I'm just saying you're just asking for it, and look, we don't even have laws, this is such a bullshit, right, because all, all the systems of actual accountability for people are broken, they can't even do a background check technically in this country, because none of the information from one state is shared with another state, I mean, you know, it, it's that bad. I mean, Bundy was a serial killer, okay, and they had him in jail, and they didn't know he was a serial killer. I mean, that kind of stuff is actually happening. It's so, the system is so deliberately broken, and part of it's broken is to protect cops and, you know, bad doctors and lots of other people from accountability, so they can just move to another state and pretend they're clean, and they're dirty as fuck. So anyway, fuck you people.
Well, anyway, so most of the comments are just stupid. Most people are stupid, so most of the comments are stupid. You know, whatever. I mean, a lot of people are, you know, doing ragging on Jordan Peterson. They get it. That's fine. I just mean the, the people with these desperate um, defenses are just so stupid. All right. Um... I mean, you know, we'll accept both these guys would have made excellent Nazis. You know, again, that seems a bit excessive. They would just be, they'd be as, as, um, they would be as capable of, um, mission over means or something. You know, of of being of making trespasses against a legitimate means to an end, and we are all capable of being guilty of that. Like I said, if somebody does something heinous enough <laughs> to something you care about, um, you're just not going to have the same capacity. Um, you're, you're not going to. You're going to have a lot more. <laughs> You're gonna you're gonna have to apply a lot of logical work, a lot of your 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 psychology, your brain, is going to have to do a lot of nagging, to keep you from indulging in a little payback. Payback beyond what's required, rationally. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna. You know. Um, yeah, so that's enough. I, you know, enough, enough, enough. It's enough of a video, for fuck's sake. It's four hours long. Sorry about that. Uh, until the next time, such, and so forth and whatnot.